Hi everyone, I'm Jiska and in this tutorial I'm going to show you how to change Bluetooth firmware with Internal Blue. Internal Blue supports changing firmware on Broadcom and Cypress Bluetooth chips and the operating system on top can be one of these, which is almost everything. So it supports the most recent Android, the most recent iOS, also the most recent macOS and also Linux with Blues. You can check it out on GitHub. The idea of this type of project is to have mobile devices, but for wireless research. So when I first started my PhD, I thought like software defined radios, these are the tool. And I used them for a lot of things like visible light communication and millimeter waves. But well, you can draw every bit with them and so on. Still the stuff that you can do with them often does not end up in real devices. And when you use with everyday devices, uh, some, some stuff like, uh, let's say Bluetooth, you will find yourself uh, with very bad software defined radio support. The reason for this is that the Bluetooth specification is already 3000 pages and other wireless specifications are even more complex than this. And someone needs to build this into a software defined radio. This often does not happen, at least not as open source tool. And because of this, you will only find the most recent implementation, including some performance optimizations by the vendors in commercial devices, because industry just develops faster. They have more people developing this. So it's just closed source stuff that has the most recent features and that works well. So wouldn't it be nice if we somehow could use existing chips by industry that are well maintained with the most recent Bluetooth specification, for example, and then modify them in a way that's similar to software defined radio. Well, first of all, we need to find a device that has a recent chip. And this is the case for example, for smartphones. So they are the most commonly available ones that have recent chips in contrast to development kits. And they also have a full stack integration. So they have a Bluetooth daemon and everything that just works well. And now the only question that remains is, can we somehow do this part here? So the critical part now is, can we modify the firmware that's running on a chip in a smartphone on a wireless chip? And for this, we need to go through a framework creation process. So first of all, we need a rooted Android phone or a jailbroken iPhone. And then we need to extract the wireless firmware somehow. So it might be encrypted, for example. Then we need to reverse engineer the firmware and analyze how it communicates uh, with the operating system, how the firmware updates are applied. And if we are lucky, we can also get code execution on the chip. So first of all, extract firmware, get code execution. These are the two like really critical parts in this process. And once we get the code execution, we should make some framework to make programming it easier. So at least assembler, maybe even C um, and some possibility to hook into all of this. Quite often I get the question, why does internal blue only support Broadcom and Cypress chips? Why not the Nordic chips? Why not the Qualcomm chips? But the answer to this is actually adding another Bluetooth chip is almost as much work as just adding a different wireless technology because you need to somehow reverse engineer the firmware, somehow get code execution. And uh, this is so much work for yet another Bluetooth chip. You could also just do something completely different. So there is another project that colleagues of mine have been working on, which is called Nexmon. It basically does the same for Wi-Fi. Then there's internal blue. Both of them work on the most recent Broadcom and Cypress chips. And basically this is stuff that you find in the latest, the latest Samsung Galaxy S series, the iPhones, the MacBook, the Raspberry Pi, etc. So there's a ton of hardware that supports this. Then recently I've also been looking into LTE chips by Intel and I have an RC3 talk about this. You can take some preview of what you might expect to be there, even though it was mainly security research, but we also looked a bit more into this. So there will be some updates soon. And I've also been looking into ultra wideband together with a colleague. So there will also be some updates on this. 
Uh, next month, there is a talk at Black Hat and also DEF CON about the ultra wideband chip in the iPhones and Apple Watch, etc. Now, let's get started with some internal blue internals. First of all, to understand what happens in Bluetooth and between the host and the chip, you need to understand the host controller interface. So in Bluetooth terminology, the host is the operating system. So for example, it could be Android or iOS and the controller is the chip that runs the firmware. And the host is sending some commands over HCI and the controller replies with events. So one example would be if you connect to another Bluetooth device. So for example, your headset, then the host would send a connect command to the Bluetooth MAC address and the controller would immediately say, okay, I'm going to try to connect to this address. So that's an immediate response. And then it would try to connect to the other chip using the link management protocol, LMP. This can take a bit longer. It could also uh, result in a timeout or maybe the other device just does not accept connections, but ideally it would succeed and then after all of this process on the wireless link eventually the controller replies with a connection handle so that this can later on be used in further in, in the connection so to control the controller we need to somehow inject hci commands and the very very first version of internal blue only supported android on Android, it's pretty simple. So you can recompile the Bluetooth module. Uh, and once you did this, you basically can just open two ports to either inject or read HCI. So that's really, really simple, already supported out of the box. But later on, Android was updated in a way that is meant to be a read-only interface and introducing some features was really painful here. So instead of supporting this whole recompilation and modifying source code, we decided to instead just inject into the serial device. Um, so there's a device driver and you can just echo into it. It's not as clean, so there might be stuff that breaks, but usually this just works and then you don't need any complicated uh, source code adaption here. On Linux, the blue Bluetooth stack just has HCI sockets, so you can just directly use them as they are. Then there is macOS, and on macOS you have so-called private frameworks. So private frameworks are frameworks that are not documented, but actually the IO Bluetooth framework has been the same for years, at least the part that supports HCI, and you can easily uh, do the same stuff as on the other operating systems. The iOS support is a bit different. So on iOS, we just detach the original Bluetooth daemon and instead attach internal blue over the uh, UART or PCI Express interface. So this comes with some drawbacks because the original Bluetooth client is no longer running, but then you can also reattach it uh, depending on what you want to do and it keeps some of the features. So it just depends on what you want to do and the way how internal blue is hooking into different operating systems also changes some of the behavior. Now the question is, what if we want to replace some events and commands, what happens? So this cannot be done just with the hooks that I showed previously, but um, you need to have something different. So with Frida, you can dynamically rewrite uh, functions and control them and also the arguments that they receive and with Frida I have yet another tool uh, that I just published to change uh, the bits and bytes that are exchanged over HCI. So for example you can now uh, simulate some behavior by the controller and check what the operating system would be doing or you can also do this in the opposite direction. You can also do this for fuzzing and we have another Bluetooth fuzzing project um, that goes into this direction that is called Toothpicker. Now that we can inject HCI commands or even modify uh, existing commands and events, the next question is how do we even control the chip? Because the Bluetooth specification only specifies stuff like creating a connection, nothing to directly modify firmware. So 
actually Broadcom and Cypress implemented some vendor specific HCI commands. And these include a variety of things. So for example, uh, when the Bluetooth daemon initializes, usually it would uh, send a download mini driver command to the chip and then the chip would stop all the threads that are currently being executed. Then there is a write RAM command and the write RAM command is then sending some patches to the chip and later on the lunch from command would continue the execution including the patches so this is stuff that only works on these two types of chips and luckily there's even a read ram command so we can now also read the firmware from the chip so we actually have the two critical parts for the framework creation process we can extract the firmware and we can get code execution on the chip because the firmware update mechanism is not secured in any way. It's still not that simple because Broadcom started to roll out some patches against patching, but they cannot really change the update mechanism. So this is hard coded in ROM. There is no way to change it. So what they do is when they apply the patch, they remove the read RAM and write RAM command. So once the patches were applied, but temporarily applied, you can no longer use them. But with each chip restart, the same patches have to be applied. So you can just either uh, downgrade it. So that's the easiest uh, bypass, just downgrade the patch file to an earlier version, or you might even be able to understand the patch format and remove the patches that uh, disallow reading and writing to the RAM of the chip. And there is no secure boot, nothing, so you can easily just do this on all the um, operating systems that now have Bluetooth patch files that prevent you from modifying firmware. All right, now that we can patch the firmware, we still need to somehow understand how this exactly is working. So it's still not as simple because, well, the firmware is in ROM, how can it even be patched at all? So that's uh, one of the questions I, I get from time to time uh, still, because people are just confused when I say firmware is in ROM and we apply patches. Uh, so ARM has a flash patch unit, at least the Cortex M3 and M4 that is used in the Broadcom chips. So how does it work? The chip usually just has a ROM. So here's the code that's read and executed, a RAM that's also writable and in the configuration on those chips also executable. So you can always execute in RAM uh, and that's it. So the ROM is then changed with the flash patch as follows. So there's a patch RAM enabled bitmap that's just having uh, one or zero bits depending on if a slot is enabled or not with a patch. And then there is a patch RAM target table. So these are addresses uh, of the target in ROM. So they need to be four byte aligned and each slot uh, has only a four byte length. And then there are the contents. So the four byte contents of each slot in a predefined memory region, which is followed by the actual code. Now let's look into some example, how this is being used. Uh, so actually, let's say in ROM, we have a function at the position CAFE and we have this patchram enabled bitmap. So let's say we use slot 23 for this. So we just set the 23rd bit to one. Then in the patchram target table, we have the offset uh, 23 times four because uh, four times due to the address length and there we just write the target which is CAFE and then at the patch from contents we have to say for example at this position we now want to have the uh, instruction branch with link uh, and a branch links instruction is always four byte or also a branch instruction is always four byte on ARM so this is just sufficient to branch to another location and it, at the other location we now have arbitrary space so more than four bytes and there we can execute a longer function so usually all the patches would just um, 
no longer run the old code, but they would branch to a new memory region and then eventually branch back, but usually they just execute new code. Let's take a look at the Raspberry Pi 4B. The Raspberry Pi OS image provides four different firmware patch files and each contains the chip's firmware. When we open this in a hex editor, we can see the firmware name. This is written via the HCI command fc4d, a length of cc, to the address 219c42. We can confirm that this patch file was actually loaded by checking this address with internal blue. We need to override the firmware file with an older version to be able to read the RAM in the patch RAM region. Once we do this, we can see that even the outdated version is using almost all of the 128 patch RAM slots since the ROM has been built in 2014. Now, the issue with the patch RAM is that it's very, very, very limited. So initially it was not really made for security. Initially it was made to um, just patch in production, so to say. So the chip gets a ROM image and then once it's tested uh, with other devices, there might be performance issues or crashes or something that's not specification compliant. And then one could fix it with the patch RAM slot. But suddenly some people started doing security research and this resulted in the issue that suddenly the patch RAM slots were no longer sufficient. So the estimation of how many bugs do we have in the software um, and how, how many of them do we need to fix just did not really scale with security fixes. If you want to create your own patches, there are a couple of tools that you can use. So some devices are supported by the official Cypress platform and there you can just define addresses and then also write your own patches. Or you can also use the Frankenstein emulator that was made for a different purpose, but it also supports writing patches in C. Then we have a part in next month with the Bluetooth work in progress branch. Uh, so it's not really finished, but you can write, for example, HCD files, which is the patch file format for the Nexus 5. But most of the time, I don't really like writing C because the patch RAM is so limited and you need to align each and every byte here and there, and you need to take care of all the registers. So most of the time I'm just, yeah, writing plain assembly. Now let's take a look into the setup. Internal Blue is available on GitHub, so you can simply check it out there. First of all, there are general installation instructions because it's just a Python package that you can install. However, you should also take a look into the specific instructions for the operating system that you want to run it on, because there might be some more complicated setup like routing an Android phone, building the Bluetooth module, etc. But the basic setup is very simple, so you can just see it here. Um, you can just simply install it via pip and that's it. Every now and then I get requests for patches and I think it's pretty hard to write certain patches for certain things. So I'm now going to show you one of the latest feature requests and how I solved it. Now you need to understand the link management protocol. Actually. Uh, the Bluetooth Classic is using it for connection management, like the connection state to sampling sequence, encryption, etc. And most of it is not visible to HCI. Now, let's say um, you have a host that is establishing a connection via the controller. And then during this establishment, it's also asking the other device, which device type it is, which features it's supporting and so on. And so because of this, the link management protocol would send a request and then during the reply, the controller would already um, apply certain feature configurations locally for this connection, but also as information to the host, forward the same packet later on to the host. So if you would just replace some of this information here in the event, then you would have the issue that the controller would have asynchronous information. And this is an issue for many experiments. So for example, if you would just change the hopping sequence, uh, 
that the controller sends to the other device, but not the one that is then also applied to the controller, you might also get out of sync. So this leads to various issues. Just be aware of this, that the state of all of this is not only in one packet, but also in the packet reply and in the state of the controller and the host. Here you can see a read remote support features command. The remote controller replies with a list of supported features, which are FF, FF, 8F, FE, and so on. The patch that we are going to write in the following changes these features. So after loading the patch and when connecting again, these features look differently. You can see that these are now BE, BA, FE, CA, 0D, etc. So actually we need to reverse engineer packet handlers. So it starts with the link manager handle events, which is a large stage machine. And the state machine is also um, handling LMP, but also different stuff of the link manager. So for LMP, PD use um, the function LM handle LMP message is called, which gets the first element from the LMP message list. And then there is the link manager that handles the LMP baseband acknowledgement. So there are some uh, packets that are just acknowledged and not further processed, but there are also PDUs that require an action and these are then uh, either replied with a non-acknowledgement or uh, processed via a function. For this, the type of the PDU needs to be looked up in a table and there are two LMP types, either it's the standard type or it's the extended type um, that starts with 127. And depending on this, the table lookup would return a function. And this is the function that is now being called. And in our case, we need the link manager handle LMP features result PDU. The Bluetooth specification defines the format of LMP PDUs and how to handle them. Most LMP PDUs are defined by a one byte opcode, but there are also extended opcodes that start with 127 and have a subcode in the next byte. The LMP remote features response we are interested in has the opcode 40 and nine bytes of payload. Now, the next question is, where are LMP payloads stored? So for this, we need to reverse engineer the data structure. The LM current command is a data structure that first of all contains four bytes that don't matter for our purpose, but the next four bytes are a pointer to the actual payload. And the actual payload now contains up to 17 bytes of payload because this is the maximum length in LMP. And the payload again is a bit weird. So first of all, there's one byte for the opcode or for the extended ones, it would be the 127 uh, as an opcode and then the next byte would be the actual opcode plus the parameters. And the opcode is shifted by one uh, bit. So actually one bit of this contains the master slave or the direction of this. So um, what you can see here is that, for example, if we see a hex 50, this is actually the opcode number 40. If we further follow the LMP message handler, we can see the function that gets the pointer to the current command to handle the PDU. First, this function looks up the function that is going to be called for the specific LMP type. Remember, the LMP packet payload starts with the opcode that determines the type at offset C. Now there is a wrapper that does not seem to have any functionality. However, in the assembly view, we can see that it calls an optional hook called LMP message patch filter. We could use that later on and I tried that, but in my case, it was crashing the firmware. So finally, we do the table lookup and our LMP PDU has the opcode 40 and each table entry has eight bytes. The PDU payload length is nine bytes, which is a part of this entry. The function LM handle LMP features result PDU is the one that we modify with the patch. You can see that the decompiler is a bit off. However, the function loads the current link manager command address and the packet pointer, which is located four bytes later. And then at offset C of the packet pointer, it gets the opcode 
and the payload. The payload is applied to set some link manager state before finally passing everything to the host via HCI. In internal blue, you can use the watch command to see how memory contents change over time. In the lmcurl command pointer, we can see that byte 4 to 8 contain a memory address in reverse byte order that changes. However, when manually checking the contents at this address, these are already empty. A better way to observe memory is setting a breakpoint. When we set a breakpoint, the internal fault handler will be called and provides us with a memory dump. In the following, we set a breakpoint to the LMP features result handler. When the breakpoint is triggered, we get some redundant error handling, but it doesn't matter in our case. The RAM dump starts at zero, but the RAM is at hex 200000, so we need to subtract that from the addresses in the following. LM current command is located at hex AB74, and the pointer to the current command is located four bytes later at hex AB78. The pointer points to hex 2116B0. The payload starts with 12 zeros, then the opcode shifted by one, meaning that it is hex 50, and nine bytes of LMP features, which are FF, FF, 8F, and so on. When creating a patch, we can always start with a breakpoint in assembly. We write our own patch to RAM. In our case, there is unused memory at hex 218000. The handler that we want to overwrite is in the ROM at hex 632EA. The command pointer is at hex 20AB74 and the addresses have to be applied to ROM and RAM as you can see below. But internal blue has according functions to patch the ROM that makes it a bit easier. Next, I usually create a patch that only restores the first four bytes that are overwritten by the patch from hook and then branches back. This is to check if I made any mistakes with the register state. In either, you can double check which instructions correspond to four bytes. By default, IDA will not show the raw bytes in the assembly view. To enable this, click Options, General, and set the number of opcode bytes to four, which corresponds to the maximum instruction length of 32 bit. Now you can see how many instructions will be overwritten by a four byte aligned four byte long patch drum slot. Finally, the actual patch also overwrite uh, eight bytes in the LMP payload. Since the payload pointer is dynamic, we have to start with the LM current command pointer at the payload pointer offset and look it up. And with this, we got our final patch that changes the LMP remote features. Now let's take a brief view at the latest changes in internal blue and stuff that's going to happen soon. So for the operating system support, we now support the iPhone XS and newer, so because of the PCI Express patch. We also support macOS Big Sur, uh, but you need to disable system integrity protection because you need to modify the patch file uh, on Big Sur. Otherwise, you can just use Catalina and it works without any disabling of zip. Uh, then there is Android 11, so this just works out of the box like Android 10, except from some timeouts. And maybe there will also be BT stack uh, support soon and not just blues. So that's just another Bluetooth stack for Linux. Then re-enabling write RAM is also something that you need to do either by downgrading the firmware file. So that's the easiest option. But I have been reverse engineering the patch format for the Samsung Galaxy S series. So this can now also be um, patched to work again. Uh, with newer patches and the reading writing re-enabled. The same goes for the iPhone 7 and 8. And Robert also did some reverse engineering, so there will also be a patch for PCI Express iPhones pretty soon. And with this, I'm handing over to the Q&A, so you can now ask me all the questions that are still open. Thanks for watching.